The field of genomics offers new therapies to attack cancer, heart disease, and other chronic illnesses that afflict billions. So which stocks and ETFs offer the best way to invest in this fast-moving sector? Well, today's ETF battles a viewer-requested triple header between ARK Invest, iShares, and Global X. So who wins the battle? Find out right after this. Welcome to ETF Battles. I'm Ron DeLegge. Thank you for joining us. And if you've been enjoying our weekly show, hit the like button and check out our other originals like Spotlight along with First Look ETF with NYSE. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and be sure to check out our ETF Battles store. We've got coffee mugs, sweatshirts, and other wonderful paraphernalia. Genomics is a branch of biology that deals with structure, function, and mapping of genomes. A genome is an organism with a complete DNA set, including all of its genes. I should have paid closer attention to science in school. My area of study was pulverizing dark matter with my knucklehead teenage friends. What an embarrassment to humanity. Anyway, today's triple header was requested by Ibrahim, and it's between iDNA from iShares, GNOM from Global X, and ARCG from ARC Invest. Now, on a rare occasions like today, we'll tweak these matchups and make them a little bit more congruent and relevant. And so again, that's what we've done today, but very rare occasions. Helping us to judge today's matchup is Jessica Ferringer with ETF.com and Mike Akins with ETF Action. Judges, welcome back. It's great being here, Ron. Hey, Ron. Hey, Mike. So we've got our four battle categories, cost, exposure, strategy, performance, and then our mystery battle category where you, our judges, get to pick that single factor or multiple factors to make your arguments. I've got the scorekeeping duties, and my scorecard is ready. We're going to keep track of your decisions in each one of these categories one at a time, and then we'll declare an overall winner at the end of the show. You can also declare a split winner. Or you can protest if you'd like. Um, you can also nominate wild cards. Um, by the way, you can protest, but you cannot boycott the show. So there's a difference. But I will be keeping score, and let's get started. We've got uh, Mike with cost. Give us your take. Well, this is really one of those categories that is ultra thematic. Um, if you look at the performance underlying companies' performance amongst these three ETFs, divergence of returns, the volatility. I honestly think the last thing that really should matter in your decision is expense ratio. But when we look at it, you got uh, ARC at 75 basis points, actively managed coming in the most expensive. Um, Genome at 50 basis points, slightly more expensive than IDNA at 47 basis points. They're all fairly liquid though. From a pure liquidity perspective, you, IDNA and Genome don't even come close to the volume that you see on ARC-G, and therefore ARC-G trades at a much um, smaller spreads than the other two. I'm gonna say that from an overall expense perspective, I'm gonna give it to IDNA because it's cheapest and it is, um, it's got sufficient liquidity to, to handle trading, but I think it should be probably on the lower end of your decision-making tree for, for this battle. Thank you, Mike. Jessica, you're next in terms of cost. How do you see it? Yeah, so as Mike mentioned, ARCG does have that at higher expense ratio than the other two at 75 basis points. But honestly, for an active thematic fund, I think that's pretty reasonable. So while it's not the cheapest, I do have to give this one to ARCG. I think, he, I think you're getting a pretty good deal here for an actively managed fund. That takes us next to exposure strategy. So Jessica, you're still up. Break it down for us. Yeah, so though these are all genomics ETFs, they do all define the space a little bit differently. So Genome has a revenue requirement. All the holdings have to derive over 50% of their revenues from things like gene editing, genomic sequencing, et cetera. iDNA doesn't have that revenue requirement. It offers exposure to biopharmaceutical and healthcare equipment and service industries um, that benefit from long-term growth in genomics. ArcG has the most generous view of the space. Um, they're searching for companies that they believe will benefit from innovation in the genomics industry. Um, so as an example, the largest holding in this ETF, it's actually Teladoc, which is a 7% weight. 
Teladoc is a telemedicine and virtual healthcare company. They're not actually doing anything related to genomics in itself. So personally, I really like genomes revenue requirement. It's going to be more of a pure play on the theme. The companies in that portfolio are actually involved in genomics and they're directly benefiting from advances in the space. Thank you, Jessica. I've got you down for Genom in terms of exposure strategy. Mike, how do you see it? Give us your take. That was an excellent uh, breakdown by uh, Jessica. So she kind of stole my thunder a little bit on TDoc. So I'll let that one slide and just move on to the, the broader idea of exposure. I think when you're talking about a thematic space um, such as genomics, it's really in the eye of the beholder. Um, you really got to get under the hood and start looking at the names. Um, you know, if you think about purely trying to access um, genomics and having a requirement around that, I think you can feel a little more comfortable in the passive approach of iDNA and genome. That doesn't mean it's a better solution, but I think that Jessica makes a very fair point that their uh, methodology tends to result in companies that are truly um, playing in that genomic space. I actually have a different take. I don't, um, I do like genome. Um, I actually like all three of them, but um, the revenue requirement for me is really tricky because most of these companies, or at least a lot of the companies that are heavy in the R&D space are pre-profit, pre-revenue. And it gets difficult to really put a revenue figure around, take Moderna as an example, right? Moderna had zero revenue until the pandemic set in and now it's got all this revenue. The idea is that you're betting on the future and the future sometimes hasn't come in from a revenue perspective. Um, when I go through and look under the covers, I kind of like the diversification. I like the, the more um, immunotherapy names I see inside of IDNA. So I give the slight advantage to IDNA and that's my winner from an exposure perspective. But I think Jessica's spot on in saying that really the marketplace for genomics is it's, it's up for debate. And I think it requires a lot of digging to understand which companies best align with your view of how that fits from an investing picture. Next up is performance, and this is where our judges get to give us, again, their analysis. So, Mike, uh, shake it down for us. Which of these ETFs uh, jumps out at you in terms of uh, actual results? So, from a common inception perspective, this isn't even up for debate. Um, ArcG has absolutely crushed it. Um, I will note that that performance came in an extremely short period of time. Um, so, it came, you know, straight J-curve. Um, you know, the pandemic set in, a lot of the names went um, really um, off the charts. Uh, so from a performance perspective, ArcG has the longest track record. It has an excellent track record, but it's come with the most volatility. Um, I think looking next down the line, IDNA has provided a little better um, return stream, um, more of a return stream, what I would say that you'd expect, uh, maybe aligning more with biotech broadly. Um, and and I like that kind of idea of more of a um, pure play, pure being very um, subjective, but pure play into the biotech side, um, the pharmaceutical side. So I'm going to give it to IDNA, but with the um, complete recognition that ArcG um, has a longer time period, the performance is great, and um, it's outperformed all three from a common inception perspective. But it's done it, I believe, with a little bit more uh, flexibility in stock picking versus purely going into the theme that we're discussing today, which is genomics. Thank you, Mike. I've got you down for iDNA in terms of performance. Jessica, how do you see it in terms of performance between these three ETFs? Yeah, so as Mike was saying, the performance for these funds relative to each other is going to look quite different based on what time frame you're talking about. Year to date, ArcG has struggled. Actually, that allocation to Teladoc that I mentioned has been a pretty significant detractor from performance since that stock is down something like 34% for the year. Um, but if we widen that time frame, we look since common inception, ArcG is well ahead, just, just like Mike said. Um, it's up 133% relative to 92% for iDNA and 48% for genome. Now, when we're talking about an actively managed fund, I do think that you need to take that longer time horizon into account. You know, active funds do tend to have choppier performance. The portfolios look different than your index tracking ETFs. So obviously performance, there can be a bit of a dispersion at times. Um, but over the long term, that's when you see the benefit of active management over that full market cycle. Um, so I'm going to have to give the performance category to ArcG because over that longer time frame, it really just stands above the rest. 
We next move to the mystery battle category where our judges can pick that single factor or multiple factors to make their arguments. So Jessica, what is your mystery battle category and who wins it? Yeah, so for mystery category, I'm going to have to go with investor appeal here. You know, the ARC funds have a strong following. Kathy Wood is basically a celebrity in the ETF biz, and that is really going to show up in the assets here. So ARC G is significantly bigger than the other two. Um, it's over $7 billion in assets relative to just $300 million or so in iDNA and genome. In spite of the rough performance it's had this year, ARC G still has positive net flow for the year. The investors are sticking with it. Um, you know, I think that the reputation and their focus on disruptive innovation is really a benefit for them in this theme. And I think that's showing up in the assets that they've gathered and that are sticking there. So Archie is my winner, um, just based on investor appeal. Thank you very much, Jessica. Mike, what is your mystery battle category and who wins it? Yeah, so it's interesting. We have a very similar uh, mystery category in the sense of the size of the funds, um, the appeal of the investment, but maybe a different take. Um, you know, one of the the knocks on um, an active managed portfolio inside of an ETF is this idea that unlike a mutual fund or other pooled vehicle that you can close assets coming in, you can't do that inside of an ETF, right? So to keep that arbitrage mechanism alive, to keep the integrity of the NAV um, versus the underlying um, INAV in place, obviously the fund has to remain open for creations and redemptions. And with a strategy like ARCG and genomics in particular, where I think some of the best opportunities are going to come downstream and with respect to names, I think that is creating a little bit of a, a struggle for, for ARC going forward, ARCG specifically at a $7 billion fund. If they want to take a meaningful position into some of the names that they had, say, two, three years ago, which really drove to their outperformance, that is not so easily done. And I think it's going to, you can start to see a capture of the, I've said this before, but the tail wagging the dog in the sense that if she wants, if, if the ARC management team wants to take a significant position in a portfolio, they're going to affect the performance of those smaller companies. And I think that could be a detriment to this particular ARC strategy over the long term. I also kind of go back to that whole eye of the beholder. It really comes down to this idea of what do you like best? And I'll just give you one stat. Looking at these three ETFs, there's 88 unique holdings across all three of the ETFs that we're um, talking about today. Only five names are held in all three. So they all say genomics in the name, but it's really in the eye of the beholder. And when you're talking about something as cutting edge as genomics and really going through and saying, what companies are gonna benefit from this trend, which I think very few people would argue against the amazing things that are happening in the healthcare space and specifically within genomics. Um, it comes down to what is your belief? And I think if you really just want an active manager to do it, go with ARCG, right? Like Kathy and team have really presented that. But the downside of that is you're also taking their broader scope to that. You're taking into account the fact that it's now a $7 billion fund for me. I like to manage and control my own portfolio. I like the idea of having a diversified approach to companies playing in the genomic space. And therefore, I'm going to go with an IDNA, which gives me a diversified exposure to names that have a at least meet a certain criteria established by their passive index to be playing in that space. But very much, um, I think this above most thematic spaces is an area that comes down to um, personal appetite and your belief on the best way to get exposure because it's very unique, um, as you can tell by the difference in the portfolios. Thank you, Mike. I've got you down for IDNA. And now we've shifted to the part of the show where our judges get to pick their overall battle winner. I think I know how this is going to shake down, but I'm not going to take the words out of our judges' mouths. So, Mike, your, your final opportunity to weigh in. I'm going to go with IDNA um, for all the reasons I've, I've explained out there. I, I believe broadly it gives it a little more diversified exposure to the exact theme that we're talking about today, which is genomics. Um, I think Genome also does a good job. Um, the revenue piece is the one reason I pick IDNA over Genome. I like the concept of looking in and looking at revenue, but I think that's very difficult in a budding space where many of the companies aren't generating enough revenue to truly know yet what 
what plays that. So I give it to ID and that front. Um, hats off. Anybody that's watched me do these battles, I have nothing but respect for ARC and team. So I think, you know, if you appreciate the research like I do that they do in the space, you really, you know, you're, you can't go wrong investing in that. This is of their six actively managed strategies. This is the one I struggle with the most because I feel like it's got the most leniency. Um, and I think if you want allocation to genomics that ARC likes, you might be better off just going with ARC-K, which has a lot of these same names. Um, so I'm just going to go with IDNA um, because I like the ability to control my exposure. But I think it ultimately is a this is a very personal um, and you know, decision when it comes to investors and what your preferences are. Thank you, Mike. Jessica, your final chance to weigh in and give us your overall winner for today's triple header. Give it to us. Yeah. So while I've picked ArcG as my winner for most of the categories, I have to say that I really just do like genome the best. Um, you know, the genomics theme is a bit muddied in ArcG, given its broader definition of the space, uh, whereas that revenue requirement really ensures that every holding is directly involved in the genomics industry and it's going to benefit from advancements in those technologies. Now, admittedly, it's going to be hard to compete with Kathy Wood and ARC when it comes to getting the attention of investors. Um, but I just like the way Genome defines the index, and that's why it's my pick for the overall. Well, thank you, judges. And according to my battle scorecard, today's final winner is a split decision between iDNA, which was Mike's choice. That was a clean sweep for Mike, by the way. And then Genome uh, for Jessica, her overall winner. And it's interesting to me how you both opted for more of the rules-driven choice out of this matchup with IDNA and GNOM, sharing that same flavor, both index-linked and, of course, having a little bit slightly different uh, approaches in their indexing strategy. But nevertheless, uh, more of a rules-driven approach versus the go-anywhere type of approach that you could have with an active manager of um, Kathy Wood's stature. Um, but great, great breakdown. My mystery battle category, by the way, is Kathy Wood is 65 years old. At what point does she hang up the cleats and retire? And there is some manager risk there, right? Because you figure how much longer to, can she really keep going and how much longer does she really want to keep going and who comes after her? Will there be a smooth retirement transition these are all things you need to think about when you decide to invest in actively managed funds because that active manager may not necessarily have the same investing time frame that you have, which may be a much longer period than they have on the job. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. But a great job, judges, of breaking down today's triple header. And I think all of us, after hearing the analysis, are much smarter and also, hopefully, we'll arrive at an informed decision that leads us, hopefully, to a profitable outcome. Well done, Jessica and Mike. We appreciate your insights. Thanks, Ron. It's a pleasure uh, debating with you, Jessica. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Mike. Well, that does it for this round of ETF Battles. Which matchups would you like to see? We could do double headers, triple headers, quadruple headers. Give us your ETF ticker symbols. You can do that in the comment section below or on our Twitter feed, at ETF Guide. Be sure to like our content if you've been enjoying it. That does it again for ETF Battles. I'm Ron Legge. We'll see you next time.